Good afternoon. My name is Brian Benigali. I'm a chair of the music department. I'm so thrilled to have you all here today for our senior capstone presentations. Woo! <laughs> um, you all can come a little closer if you'd like to. Um, you don't have to, you know, be you know, leaving the space open uh, for, for, for you know, inquiry and thought. Please come down and come closer to us if you'd like. Um, it helps the presenters feel more, more, more loved as well. Please, please. Um, we have today uh, six really wonderful senior presentations, uh, work that these students have been um, undertaking for at least a year, if not longer in some cases. And I'm really thrilled that they have the opportunity to share this work with you all today. Um, you've got your program in front of you, um, of the six, six students that will be joining us. And I'll do a brief introduction for each of them. We'll take a, about a five to 10 minute break after the third presentation, um, just to have a little stretch, and then we'll continue on, and then we hope that you'll join us for a little reception out in the lobby uh, following the presentations today. So our first speaker is uh, Lily Zhuo, uh, who uh, is coming to us from China, and her capstone advisors have been Ofer and Nido. Um, her, they all have little personal fun facts to share. So uh, her musical fun fact is that um, she's collected and played 35 instruments, uh, but she still has a problem counting beats in music. <laughs> her random fun fact is uh, that she loses wallets with credit cards. Um, she lost her wallet with credit cards three, three times. times at CC, and her mom is very upset with her for that. Uh, her plans after graduation are to continue to study composition and sound art in graduate school. So please join me in welcoming Lily to the stage. Thank you all for coming to CC's presentation. Um, I'm Lily Zhao from China. I play several instruments during my childhood, including piano, pipa, uh, traditional Chinese instruments, and a few string instruments. I like to collect instruments from all over the world because I'm attracted to each instrument's timbre color. I became a music major um, in my sophomore year at CC and I have done many sound music related stuff such as composition, film scoring, and sound design. So contemporary composition is my favorite and most challenging thing for me. Why uh, study composition at CC and go into summer schools where I get to know more composers of my age? I noticed that the cultural legacy always influenced the music we create. But as an international student who studied in the Western music system, I didn't get a chance to incorporate my East Asian background into my pieces. I have been told by film composers what music they want. So one time I collaborated with the bluegrass musicians for a film score and I rescored animation for like classical Hollywood style for 40 players during the NYU summer school. But this music has little to tell about who I am and they're not the music I really want to do. So I used this thesis to document my process of exploring bicultural composition and my goal was to find my conditional voice. So did I find my conditional voice after four years of exploration? I don't think so, because it's a long process to find a conditional voice. I realized that in the learning stage, we should not limit our conditioning to a fixed style. Over the past year, I've immersed myself in research on composers, instruments, and conditional techniques, attending summer schools worldwide, and dedicated time to compose original works. I've been satisfied, it's been satisfied for me to see the outcome. So here is my ch first chamber composition that got performed. I still like how it sounds, although it's simple in structure and I use repetitions throughout. Almost two years have passed and this is the current composition I'm working on. I made the score look more contemporary and complicated. I would avoid doubling the instruments with the same notes 
and now I make the internal voice flowing and developing. So here are uh, three major uh, source of inspiration for my biocultural uh, project. So first I look into traditional East Asian music and instruments. Right after last year's junior seminar, I went to Japan over the spring break and I returned to China in summer and immersed myself in traditional music. I went to their music libraries to check out their scores and I also bought a traditional Japanese food and samisen, which is this. Uh, since I grew up watching Japanese animation and have a strong interest in film, music, I have always loved the score by composers like Joy Hiseishi and Yuichi Sakamoto. Thus, their influence on my music has been significant. Throughout my four year studies at CC, we looked at uh, many famous Western composers, and I always loved the three ballet pieces by Igor Stravinsky and George Rom's piece, especially Night of Four Moons and Eleven Echoes of Autumn. I spent most of my researching time looking to their scores and their compositional techniques. Then a few months ago, I started to look at Japanese contemporary composers, such as Toru Takimitsu, and Toshio uh, Hosokawa, and the Korean-born Germany composer Yi sang -yeon, who are greatly influenced by Western composers like Debussy and Stravinsky. And Hosokawa studied condition under Yin in Germany, and they are a great source of bicultural creativity. So my first approach to write an East Asian condition was a chamber piece called Matsuri. Matsuri means festival um, and ritual in Chinese and Japanese, which I, um, and I composed this piece last year in Germany. The first movement, Dark Forest, is heavily influenced by Japanese folk mu music, which I heard a lot during my stay in Kyoto, Japan, with ins uh, each Western instrument representing a traditional instrument. So I will let the clarinet um, presenting um, sh shinobue flute and the strings mimicking the semisense and bass drum for taiko drum. Oh, and so on um, this piece um, also adapts the traditional pentatonic scales with the four note system and the whole tone scale from George Brown's Night of Four Moons. So I'll play the beginning of George Crumb's Night of Four Moons. As we can see here in George Crumb's score, he uses C, D, E, F, uh, C, D, F sharp, A flat, uh, throughout like this melodic line in the alto flute. And I also use four notes and transpose them up and down in my piece. My composition adopts a scattered and chaotic palette influenced by the minimalism rhythm found in Japanese traditional non-theater. So I'll play the beginning of my piece. So, and in the end of this movement, 
rhythms are dri driven by powerful beats of the imagined uh, taiko drum, which is based drum in this piece. I apologize for this video not playing here, and it's kind of cool to look at. So the second movement moon depicts the ending of the ritual where the moon slowly rises to the sky, embracing a melodic uh, tone with jazzy harmonies inspired by Joy Hisaishi's film scores. I want to make a contrast with the festival-like loud first movement, and to create an image of the moon slowly rising in the sky, pizzicato in the strings is added here. I'm playing a melodic contour inspired by Yuichi Sakamoto's piece, Blue. Here's my uh, ending for the piece. Although this piece won the third place in the composition workshop, I acknowledge several outcomes in the composition and that requires improvement, improvements. For a noble aspect is the predictability and repetitiveness in certain melodies that makes the piece boring, a consequence of the piece being centered around four notes. Additionally, the first movement has three distinctive rhythm and instrumentation sections, which will not bridge into each other very cohesively. Composers have long been exploring the realm of mimicking uh, traditional instruments using Western counterparts. However, my approach lacks a comprehensive exploration of the distinctive timbre qualities in traditional instruments. So, continue my exploration of Western instrument uh, mimicking East Asian counterparts. I can pose a full solo named Aki drawing inspiration from the shakuhachi unknown flute. So uh, here's our play, um, brief audio of the shakuhachi flute. Yeah, so an um, aki in Japanese means fall and autumn, and this piece tries to capture the essence of the season that embodies change, decay, discomfort, and sorrow for me as a composer. So in the traditional East Asian music, vibrato constantly features in woodwinds, and I love how many uh, East, traditional East Asian flute have those like vibrato and microtonal quality. So this piece is also inspired by Isang's oboe solo piece, where he used oboe to mimic the tra uh, Korean traditional double reed instrument, pili. I employ his uh, main notes combinational technique, which means the main notes in a given phrase surrounded by other grace notes and, and ornamental notes in my Aki piece. Here you can see like the notes stay on sand and they change into other notes and ornaments, a grace note. Um, to the other main notes. So I will play um, the opening of my full solo piece.
So despite uh, employing fewer materials, I still encounter issues like uncohesive problems. Why this piece outlines uh, invokes a zen-like atmosphere, the conclusion adopts a more conventional approach leading to a predictable outcome. So after composing two pieces characterized by pentatonic scales and straightforward melodies, I was eager to push the boundary of my creativity and delve into a more contemporary rhyme for my next combination. I want to explore timbres and colors on a single instrument again, and this time I picked the clarinet. I look at Takimitsu's air and Hosokawa's vertical sound for inspirations. And I included many uh, extended techniques in this piece. So, which in, uh, such as multiphonics. Oh, these are like um, the recording I did with the clarinet solo players, and those are the chops from our uh, recordings. And uh, air, this is air tone. And uh, here is mouse vibrato, which is the first um, two measure of my piece. And here is flatter tongue, which is here in the piece. Uh, also, unfortunately, uh, we didn't get a uh, official like full recording of this piece because the clarinetist is still working on this piece. But I do have like a MIDI mock-up, and I will play some of my. Yeah, so looking back to this bicultural competition journey, I'm wondering uh, what East Asian contemporary music really is. Because we can write a piece completely in pentatonic scales, which young Chinese composers do a lot, and you can also like adapt uh, East Asian folk, folk, folk music, where you can pick a traditional instrument and let it do the work. But recently, I saw a quote from a scholar who talked about how he signed this does that. They say East Asian traditions provide the roots of the technique, as well as the philosophical inspiration behind the music. However, the end product of the East Asian root is realized in the context of the 20th century Western music. So this quote really um, motivates me to continue exploring uh, 21th century music in the future, and to have a stronger foundation in composition and keep experimenting with East Asian cultural legacy in my music. So here, I want to summarize what I learned from my project as a compo composition student, and I wish to give this advice to CC students who might be interested in composition in the future. Planning. Planning is important to give a better workflow and will always, always help with structures. Style. It's a long process to form a style in the learning period. Once again, you should not limit yourself to a fixed style. What music do you want to compose? Film scores, contemporary music, 
contemporary classical music, digital music, because they're all really different like uh, in the way of um, com composing them. Limit your material. Limit your material by focusing on developing and connecting them, because for a beginner com composer, they usually have a lot of uh, ideas in their piece, but they fail to connect them to make them cohesive. Don't throw away. Don't throw away anything you wrote before. You can always go back and improve them. Don't listen to others all the time. It's helpful to show your piece to others and get advice from them. But I hear constantly complaining about professors giving revising suggestions, interviewing students' competition a lot. So the student end up writing a piece way different from their original intention and they hate their creations. And at the end of the day, this is your piece and you should have full control how you want it to be. Make sure your score is, make your score professional. Make sure the musicians can read everything you wrote. If the musicians have trouble reading the score, it's probably your problem not making the notation clear. Make friends with musicians if you want to record your music in the future. And some musicians have preference in type of music they like to play. So some of them mm, might don't really don't want to do any like extended techniques and some of them may like um, prefer playing melodic stuff. And workshop and competitions. If you want to learn competition more outside CC and maybe pursue it professionally, it's always helpful to attend workshops and competitions and we like know more composers like other student composers are doing. So in the end, I invite you guys to come to my conditional recital tomorrow at 3.30 uh, in Packer Hall. I know like some um, posters have the wrong time, but it's actually 3.30. And it will feature all the pieces I show in the presentation, include two pieces I wrote before. Yeah. So thank you guys for coming. I think I do that all the time. Cause, uh, I think for this competition, uh, for for this recital as well, I was like really um, not confident for piece I wrote, cause uh, some of them are like a really silly piece I wrote like two years ago when I like first started competition. But I really love my musicians. I went to all their rehearsals and they're doing way better than the musicians I had before. So <laughs> they kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, they kind of encouraged me, um, and now I have faith for myself and like. Uh, you will always get bored with competition. Sometimes just like don't force yourself to like uh, write maybe like, I know some composer, they like write like eight hours every day, but I can't do that. Maybe you can just like take a walk and forget about it. Maybe one week later you can start. And I think uh, a better way, uh, another way I um, tell me like um, about those frustrations is to like always like hear new music from other like composers. Uh, sometimes like, uh, I know there's many like composers like in the history that's really famous but if you want to like get into like uh, contemporary competitions I think those like competition students who's young composers now who are like actively um, are probably like sometimes like more helpful to you than just like working through like some uh, maybe like uh, classical music composers they uh, want to get ideas from them yeah so.
Yeah, I think for probably the most uh, is melodies because um, I noticed that like for for like uh, the Japanese film composers, I really like their melodies because um, I think sometimes for contemporary Western music, they really like does not like prioritize melodies but like other stuff. But I really appreciate like like composers like Sakamoto or like Joy. They have like really flowy like. Um, beautiful, like jazz influenced uh, melodies in their um, piece. Uh, yeah, but also like start this conversation. I think I also limited myself too much on um, uh, East Asian stuff. I want everything to be like East Asian. I want like, uh, I, I like, I, I wrote many like um, pieces last, like sketches last summer, and each of them is like pentatonic scales, pentatonic scales. And in the end, I'm, like, I'm sick of pentatonic scales. I don't want to write it anymore. And yeah, so I also like for contemporary compositions, I also like know many friends like coming from like uh, like Colombia and they, their music is like really like uh, South uh, American vibe, but they don't limit themselves in just doing like Colombia stuff. So I really appreciate that doing that. So I think in the future, I still won't like say I'm, I'm writing an East Asian piece again, because I think their influence is like, um, I like, uh, I take all their influence, but I won't just say um, uh, I'm from e China, so I only write Chinese music. So I think that's the thing I want to avoid. And also for students who want to do like bicultural competition in the future. So I think one really like important stuff from my journey is really don't limit yourself on just writing stuff. Don't stick to yourself to uh, one, like maybe Pantone scales again, or maybe stick yourself to uh, one like traditional instrument. I know I have many like flutes, uh, inspired pieces, uh, but I won't like, limit myself doing that like in the future. Thank you guys. Okay, so as you can see in your program, I'm going to talk about music therapy as a framework for alternative healing practices. And to give you a sense of kind of where we're headed, here's a roadmap. So I'll briefly talk you through how we hear and process music, musical and spiritual practices and healing, a history of Western medicine, music therapy as a methodology. I'll go through some examples and finally explain how music therapy can be used as a framework. And now, why does this matter, and how can we look at that and see evidence? So I focus on music therapy in two specific populations, those being Alzheimer's disease and autism spectrum disorder. These were very intentionally chosen for several reasons. Firstly, these communities are very important to me personally. I work in skilled nursing and have seen firsthand the impact of Alzheimer's on loved ones, and I've seen caretaker burnout and how caring for those with Alzheimer's takes a toll on everyone involved. For autism spectrum disorder, I would first like to mention that I don't care for the word disorder, as this as a Latin prefix typically means bad, and I don't want to discuss autism spectrum disorder as an inherently bad thing. 
but uh, rather as a challenge in today's society. I grew up on the spectrum, and music was important to me as a form of expression and an outlet. And for many individuals with autism spectrum disorder, it is so much more than just an outlet. Finally, I chose these two because of the similarities in pathology. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative condition, and autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental condition, and both are characterized by difficulty expressing oneself. And this is relevant as a healing factor because the language processing centers of the brain are totally separate from those of music processing. So, but in order to understand that, I think that we should talk about the physiology of hearing and how we get to the brain. So the process of hearing sound is relatively straightforward. Vibrations from the sound travel through the ear via the eardrums and the ossicles and reach the cochlea where it agitates the tiny hairs and sends a signal to the brain where it's registered as sound. In the brain, pleasant music activates opioid systems which release feel-good hormones and feel-good transmitters, um, the same hormones that are released during exercise, sex, and even eating food. So physiologically, the process of hearing sound is the same across cultures and around the world, so we can apply this, these processes in different contexts. So now I'm going to discuss the link between music and spirituality. So in my essay, I touched on three religious practices, hymnody and Christianity, the role of music in the majority religion of Bali, Agamakirta, and how music is involved with trancing practices cross-culturally. More important is how music is connected to spirituality. For many, music is so intertwined with religion because of its presence in religious practices and rituals. The way I want to relate them is just a little bit different, though. Historically, religion and music go together, and religious practices have been central to healing for the most part since their inception. For example, Jesus healed the blind and the sick in Christianity, and many religions promise different versions of healing um, if you follow them. Investigating alternative healing means acknowledging spiritual healing and music as it is connected and facilitates that. So just to kind of summarize that, music is irrevocably intertwined with spiritual practices, and most of these interventions include some form of music, specialized sound, and or prayer, and most traditional healing contexts consider religion or the supernatural critical to the success of any intervention. And now I'm going to do a brief history of Western medicine just to understand how we got to where we are today in the environment music therapy is being practiced in. So Western medicine comes out of the Age of Enlightenment, which was in the 1600s to 1700s, and those scientific discoveries that were made during that time. And from the same place comes this total separation of science and religion that we have today, because prior to scientific discoveries, it was believed that disease was sent as a punishment from God and healing was sent as a reward. And so this, once we discovered science, it kind of really created this division that we have today, which is not to say that it's all negative. M many great scientific discoveries were made. We live in a heliocentric solar system, germ theory, super important things that we um, know all about today. Um, one other effect, though, of that was that we now focus on drug-based treatments and non-holistic healing with medicine for profit. So today, when someone goes to the doctor, they typically leave having been prescribed a drug to alleviate their systems, symptoms, often without addressing any other aspects of holistic health. Um, so now that we've established the medical environment of today, it's time to discuss music therapy. Music therapy as an intervention began development in the 1980s, and it began to be practiced in earnest around the start of the 21st century in combination with psychotherapy. As for evidence-based outcomes, healings have been documented associated with music-based cultural practices as well as impacts noted in a clinical setting. I also used biofeedback as evidence for this because biofeedback is the concept of learning to control involuntary responses, such as your heart rate, skin temperature, and even the electrical conductance of skin, which is relevant because those are all reducing sympathetic tone or interrupting fight or flight response. And music therapy often has a similar effect of relaxing the body. Um, however, I do want to mention just some quick conceptions 
or conventions about music therapy, which is that we use the notions of Western tonality and consonance, dissonance, and resolution, which is not, as Lily kind of talked about, is not true in all places, in all, in anywhere in the world. So now I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease and share some statistics to emphasize the importance of alternative treatments. So as of right now, about 6.5 million U.S. citizens have Alzheimer's disease and a population of 3.500 million oh, and of like people who live here. And so about 10% of adults age 65 and older have Alzheimer's disease. An average lifetime cost of treatment is $254,000. The current numbers are expected to rise to about 10 million by 2030 as the baby boomer generation ages. Symptoms of Alzheimer's disorder are centered around thought, memory, and language. In the beginning stages of Alzheimer's, an individual may forget names or if they've told you something. As it progresses, they will lose their memories and ability to communicate and they eventually will require total care. As of right now, we have drugs to slow the progress of the disease, but we no cure, so to speak. Additionally, the toll of caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease is difficult to understand unless you have experienced it. Music can help with communication due to the fact, as previously mentioned, speech and music are processed in different locations of the brain. In clinical settings, music has had a significant impact resulting in reduced agitation, improved facial recognition, and even improved language skills. This quote from Oliver Sacks, whose book Musicophilia was instrumental in my research, music evokes emotion and emotion can bring memory bring its memory, shows how music can aid in a person retaining their sense of self as they lose their memories and the disease progresses. For autism spectrum disorder, it is estimated based on diagnoses that one in 36 children are on the spectrum and is four times more common in men than women, which exposes another issue in medicine, the fact that standards are decided based on men, leading to women going undiagnosed for most of their life with in various different um, fields. Challenges associated with autism spectrum disorder are mainly speaking, processing, nonverbal cues, social interaction, and what society considers normal behaviors. So music therapy has been able to help facilitate social interaction and communication, which are two of the more difficult challenges that a lot of children struggle with. Um, but since the Age of Enlightenment, Healing that is not based in what I'm going to refer to as hard science has largely been discounted. In spite of cultural healing practices having real value and working as has been, as we have documented for centuries, um, within Western medicine, many practitioners are not open to new ideas, which has really led to an absence of alternative healing practices. However, music therapy kind of opens the door to this person-centered healing and holistic healing that I think we should move towards. So first of all, music allows for an individual approach to holistic healing. You can really meet someone right where they're at. You can individualize the music that you are playing. You can individualize the instruments that are being used in music therapy, and you are able to help them in different ways depending on what they're str struggling with at the time. Um, and Alzheimer's disease and autism spectrum disorder are good examples because the neurological impacts we can see, first of all, we can see short-term impacts and acquire data relatively quickly. Additionally, we can do brain scans to look at what is happening during music therapy and we can see what is happening real time. Also, they are re pretty prevalent in today's society. Finally, music is processed the same way across cultures. Everyone kind of hears it more or less the same way the vibrations hit their ears and it goes to their brain. Um, therefore, this has a wide range of applications. Finally, I would like you all to try. The clip I am going to play is less than a minute. Everyone has less than 60 seconds. I want you to close your eyes and breathe deeply and just listen to the music.
Okay, so you all just interrupted sympathetic tone and reduced your stress, physiologically speaking. Um, which it may or may not. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. So let me, cool. So the conclusions I want to draw from this are that person-centered healing is something that we should really be moving towards and music therapy can offer an open door because it is based in what I'm referring to as hard science. And we can see these evidence-based outcomes even though we've only been really using music therapy as a practice in earnest for less, for less than three decades, for you know 20-ish years. And so I think in the future, we can expand the uses for music therapy and use it as a framework to introduce different alternative healing practices into medicine. Thank you. Yeah, I mean healing that is not, okay, you have these symptoms, let's fix them. I mean healing that is approaching the whole person and individually looking at their case. Their case. Yes. Yes, I do. So there's several different um, in instances of this, and I don't want to say the words because I know I'm going to mess them up. But so for, so actually, if I can pull it up, that would be really helpful. So trancing is a healing practice in Bali, specifically. They have collective um, practice, collective rituals and practices where they will go through, um, they will go through these trancing and involve healing, and they will involve it involves um, helping with fertility, crops, that kind of thing. And then there's also one other example that I use, which is Persian, and it is called Mada, I think is how it is pronounced, and it's a it's a genre of devotional music, prayer, and meditation and Persian mystical po poetry, which is performed for multiple cultural purposes, including the maintenance of health and healing. So um, there are a lot of different examples of this. Um, those are two examples that I kind of went into a in a little bit more depth. Did that answer your question? So I first have four years of medical school that I need to do. I also need to graduate. And then I can go to medical school um, eventually. And once I have learned the science and I go through residency, I hope to incorporate um, different people's cultures and be able to, ref even if I may not be an ex, I will not be an expert in all forms of cultural healing, but if that is something that they're into, I hope to build a network of different cultural healers that I can refer them to. And then I can also recommend things like visiting, I mean, just even something so simple as visiting a nutritionist to aid with different problems that we have now or recommend stress reducing techniques to help reduce other medical conditions that we have that right now we mostly just prescribe drugs for.
getting into my actual presentation, I'd like to take a moment for everybody just to think and reflect on their past couple days and think about some good things that have been happening in their lives. to share one or two things that are, that are going on in their lives that are really good um, or that they just want to share with the rest of the room. My presentation is titled No Students Left Behind, and for those of you who are familiar with Three Days Wesley's Jerusalem Music, um, there is a bass clef up there, kind of turned upside down into like a frowny face. Um, but I'm a bass player, so I chose a bass clef, and it fits in with my title, um, which I'll elaborate a little bit more on in a minute. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. For those of you who do not know me, hi, my name is Ethan Jules. I use he, him pronouns. And my senior capstone exists within the subject of music education. Some of you may know music education. Um, some of you in the music department might know music education as the discipline that is going to be approved as its own major at CC next year for the past four years. In all seriousness, however, I feel incredibly lucky and grateful to be surrounded and taught by passionate music educators here at CC. This in itself is a large reason why my academic career has progressed in the direction of music education. My capstone project takes an in-depth look at praxis within kindergarten through eighth grade music classrooms. Praxis can be simply defined as the practical application of a theory. In the context of my capstone project, Praxis refers to ways in which music teachers incorporate educational theories and studies in their classrooms, be it intentional or not. One thing to mention is that music educational theories often engage other theories and forms of knowledge, such as developmental psychology, body theory, and critical race theory, to name a few. There are three major components to my capstone project, research, observations, and writing. In order to examine the ways in which teachers incorporate educational theories into their teaching practices, I first had to learn more about the educational theories that I would examine. This endeavor has been an ongoing process that started my first year at Colorado College and will likely never end. Another component of my project involved conducting observations within music classrooms across Colorado Springs. The motivation behind this was to witness in real time how music education spaces operate and to what degrees teachers embody educational theory in their teaching practices. The final component of my thesis project centers around a reflective academic paper where I ruminate through my research and observations. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that by no means am I an expert when it comes to music education. I, like many other educators, am in a constant state of learning. This capstone project served as an excellent opportunity for me to become more conscious of the most effective ways in which I can incorporate educational theories when I begin my career as a music teacher or a teacher. I would also like to mention that this project focuses specifically on traditional music education as it exists within classrooms, as opposed to non-traditional music education, such as communal education and informal music education. Although I believe non-traditional forms of music education should be incorporated in music classrooms within the United States, 
The scope of this presentation does not extend into that area. I will begin by introducing a problem. Within the United States, children's views of themselves as musical deteriorate over time, and their beliefs about musical talent as an innate characteristic that only certain individuals possess grow stronger. The title of my presentation, No Student Left Behind, is a reminder that thousands of students stop pursuing music because they see, them, see themselves as less musical over time. In addition to this, my title is a call to educators in the United States to recognize the ways in which they are partially at fault for this phenomenon. This reality guided my research in the direction of investigating educational theories and looking to see if there are any educational theories that teachers can incorporate into their practice to mitigate this finding. But before we get into that, why care? Well, when students do not see themselves as musical and view musical talent as an innate characteristic, they are more likely to discontinue their participation in music-related activities inside and outside of the classroom. Given the positive impacts that playing an instrument and participating in a school music program have on cognitive motor and socio-emotional skills within children, educators and musicians should be aware of what causes students to stop making music. All right, I'll begin by talking about some of my observations. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with talking you through all the IRB exemptions that I had to receive in order to conduct my research. I will mention, however, that I had to complete an educational research exemption and an interaction research exemption. Because of the, these IRB procedures, I'm not able to include photos or videos of teachers or students in their music classrooms. While working towards my IRB exemptions, however, I reached out to music teachers in Colorado Springs, introducing myself and expressing my desire to conduct observations in their classrooms. With the help of Jennifer Joaquin in an old syllabus from Joyce Hannigan's K-12 Music Elementary Practicing Course, I was able to establish contact with three teachers. I found it important and significant to conduct my observations in Colorado Springs in an effort to engage with the local community. The first set of observations I conducted were at Jack Swigert Aerospace Academy in Ms. Vasquez's middle school chorus class. Here, I spent five days watching as Ms. Vasquez prepared her students for their upcoming performance of Willy Wonka Jr. and their winter concert. That's interesting. Right? The second set of observations I conducted were at Buena Vista Elementary School with Ms. Lachelle. Here, I spent two days observing her classes that range from kindergarten to fifth grade. The content of each class varied depending on the ages of students with a focus on vocal, listening, and movement-based activities for the younger groups of students and a focus on instrumental performance for their older groups. The third set of observations I conducted were at Sabin Middle School with Mr. DiNardo's middle school concert band classes. I spent five days at Sabin Middle School with Mr. DiNardo and his students as they rehearsed their upcoming concert pieces. During this next section of the presentation, I am to provide concrete examples of how the music teachers I observed embodied educational theory through their teaching practices. For the sake of time, I will give only one example for each of the teachers that I observed. These connections occurred rather naturally as are reflected on my experiences in their classrooms. All right, to kick things off, we're gonna look at Mr. DiNardo's classroom. Throughout my observations in Mr. DiNardo's class, it appears as if he was more invested in his students' well-being and sense of belonging as opposed to their musical growth. This observation led me to believe that his teaching style was heavy, heavily aligned with humanism, which is a student-centered approach that focuses on the healthy development of each student towards their full potential. Humanist theory highlights Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which, is, which in an educational context suggests that students are less likely to pay attention and learn during class if their more basic human needs are not met at that time. That is to say, it is more difficult for a student to learn if they are hungry, tired, and feel unsafe. One way Mr. Donato sought to satisfy his students' more basic needs was by encouraging his students to eat during lunchtime, since many students would wander in his class during lunch without having eaten anything. In addition to this, Mr. Donato was to his students a trusted person they could share their feelings with. In one instance, he spent his entire passing period confronting a student who was, or comforting a student who was experiencing cyberbullying. I'd like to take a moment for you to recall back to the beginning of the presentation when I asked you all to think about the good things going on in your life. I want you to think about how you felt during that moment 
and maybe what the other people around you were feeling. Just a couple more moments of pondering and reflecting. Ms. Suzanotto spent ap ample time during each class developing a sense of belonging while boosting his students' self-esteem. At the beginning of each class, Mr. DiNardo prompted his students to share good things or events in his students' lives that they found exciting or positive. Multiple students shared during each class, demonstrating the fact that most of these students felt comfortable expressing themselves verbally in his classroom. Sometimes these icebreakers lasted for 20 minutes. By operating within this humanistic framework, Mr. DiNardo promoted an air of acceptance in his classroom where each of his students felt that their presence was valued. This accepting classroom environment translated to an enthusiasm for participating during class and a desire within the students to become better musicians. Within this desire, there exists more opportunities for students to develop their musical skills and therefore feel more talented. Moving on to Ms. Lachelle. Many of Ms. Lachelle's teaching practices aligned with the tenets of music learning theory, or one of the le leading theories of how people learn to listen to and participate in the act of music. Music learning theory posits that music is learned through a similar process to how we learn language, which begins with audiation, also described as listening comprehension. Within her classroom, Ms. Lachelle implemented a variety of audiation exercises which focus on enhancing students' listening comprehension skills. These exercises included call and response activities in which students would listen to Ms. Lachelle as she sang and then repeat back what they heard. In addition to this, Ms. Lachelle taught using the whole part whole strategy which splits up an entire piece into smaller, more digestible sections for call and response. In her instrumental classes, Ms. Lachelle would often play the melody the students were practicing before they began practicing while stressing, stressing the importance of listening. Just as, a, as learning a variety of words is important for the development of a child's language skills, so is learning a variety of music. That said, another important element of music learning theory is exposing students to a variety of music, which includes songs with different meters, rhythms, key signatures, and songs from a variety of cultures and musical practices. In her lower elementary classes, Ms. Lachelle made a conscious effort to include a diversity of songs in her students' repertoire, including songs with complex rhythms and others with lyrics in Spanish. Throughout my observations, it was clear that Ms. Lachelle's knowledge of music learning theory was manifested within the classroom and teaching practices. These learning theories incorporated by Ms. Lachelle bolstered essential skills needed by students to succeed in music ed education spaces and feel more talented. During my time in Ms. Vasquez's classroom, it quickly became apparent that she had mastered her presence as a teacher in order to enhance student engagement and following of classroom norms. One of the ways that teacher presence can be understood through a theoretical lens is through proxemics, or the field of knowledge that deals with the amount of space that people feel necessary to step between themselves and others. When understanding how proxemics functions within a classroom, we can look at the physical distance between the teacher and their students throughout different situations. Since the teacher is most responsible for creating the classroom environment, their movement in relation to students has the most influence on how proxemics ma manifest within the classroom. In general, teachers should, avoid, teachers should move around the classroom and avoid standing or sitting in one location that indicates their authority, for example, behind a podium, desk, or piano. And learning to navigate the space of the classroom, teachers become more effective at classroom management. It's working again. We'll see how far this cord can reach. What's up, Ryan? How's it going? Well, you you doing well? I'm doing. I'm doing pretty well. I feel. Yeah, it's all right. I feel a little bit ill, but you know, I'm I'm pushing through it right now. Um, so I just want to ask you, you know, how are you feeling now that you know I was standing up there by that podium and now I'm you know right right um, real close to you, so how does that feel? I'm feeling better than if you were right here. 
<laughs> so you want me to you want me to stay out of the intimate zone? Is that what you're saying? Okay, maybe maybe we'll go to the social zone. Um, I think right now we're more in the friend zone right now. You feel connected. All right. So, the purpose of that exercise. Thank you, Ryan. Everybody, give it up for Ryan. The purpose of that exercise was to demonstrate the ways in which my presence as a presenter impacts how Ryan is perceiving me and how you all are perceiving me in the audience. You know, take, take a minute or two to make your own conclusions from that. Ms. Vasquez was very adept at navigating throughout her classroom to influence behaviors of her students in the atmosphere of the room as a whole. During vocal rehearsal, she slowly walked around the classroom and sang with her students in an effort to get all of the students to participate. When she noticed that a student or group of students were not singing, she would spend more time in their area. For the most part, when Ms. Vasquez passed by students, they would begin to sing louder. In addition to this, Ms. Vasquez also approached students and squatted next to them when having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. These conversations ranged from asking students questions to getting students to refocus their intention in class. Through her awareness of her own body presence and in, in the music classroom, Ms. Vasquez was able to effectively redirect attention and better manage her classroom. So I've got some key takeaways from this presentation that um, help to inform you know, what I learned and what I'm taking away from this presentation as a future teacher. First off, students' views of themselves as musical deteriorate over time, but there are ways for music teachers to counter this finding. I have discussed some of these methods here with you today. However, even more skill and practice is required to know what circumstances to employ these skills in. Number two. Music teachers intentionally and unintentionally manifest educational theories through their teaching practices. That one kind of is self-explanatory. Number three, students' basic needs must be met before they can meaningfully learn and develop within the classroom. In a nutshell, this means that students must feel safe and physically well in order to learn. Teachers play a large role in creating a welcoming and safe classroom environment. Number four, music learning begins with listening. Incorporating listening exercises within a music class is a sure way to develop the musicality of a student. The secret is finding a balance between familiar and unfamiliar sounds and songs. And lastly, being aware of how your body functions within the space of a music classroom is a crucial aspect of classroom management. Body language can drastically influence the degree to which students feel acknowledged in the classroom, and the knowledge of proxemics can help teachers redirect the attention of their students. So what's next with my capstone project? I'm currently in the process of completing a capstone paper which speaks to everything I have mentioned in this presentation and beyond. This essay does not have a central argument, but is rather a synthesis of the educational theories and studies that I have consumed in combination with my experiences in real music classrooms. As I mentioned earlier in this presentation, one of my main goals for my capstone project is to analyze the ways in which praxis exists within music classrooms, to behold the ways in which teachers bring educational theories to life. Through writing a reflective academic paper, I have had the opportunity not only to examine educational theories and studies, but also reflect on their utility and the best ways to incorporate them into teaching practices. In addition to this, writing my capstone essay has encouraged me to profoundly contemplate my experiences in, in these music classrooms and gain a glimpse into what it is like to be an educator in these spaces. Before I conclude, conclude, I would like to express my gratitude towards a handful of people who supported me throughout this process. Thank you to Liliana Carrizo, Ryan Banyagali, Nikki Coomer, Jennifer Joaquin, Joyce Hannigan, Amanda Udis Kessler, and the three teachers who welcomed me into their classroom in December. Thank you everybody for listening. Are there any uh, questions?
wonder if I'm just going to push it just in a slightly different direction and wonder if it moves into my actual campaign. The three spaces of the Razor Disc system that you're proposing in that framework include Springfield, the Springfield Olympic Stadium, the Royals, and Yankee Doodle 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 Which is the science of that? Good question. No, 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 no. I've got, I've got some stuff that, that came to mind initially. I mean, at first, if we're thinking about like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and like humanistic tendencies, you know, if you're in a band, a big thing about that is cooperation between members of the band. And it's really hard to cooperate when you're, I mean, like in any situation when you're feeling like unwell or you're, you haven't had breakfast or lunch or dinner, you know? So I think Addressing those more basic needs is super important for the space of a band to function. Um, if we're thinking about like the role of you know proxemics within like a performance, for example, also you know you see like video clips or you go to a concert and like the crowd goes wild when like the the singer is like ah! you know like they're like kind of they get up in everybody's faces and it's more personal because they're more. They feel more connected with the audience in a way because the audience is, you know, they're participating in the spectacle of performance and they feel more connected to the performer because of the proximity of distance between them. So those are some things that came to mind um, right off the bat, but it's a good question. I think 100%, yes. Um, I'm not exactly sure it was different in every situation, but in some of the classrooms, um, my presence was very valued. You know, people, people were trying to impress me, and I think people were behaving better in some instances when they saw me, somebody who was, you know, like more relative their age, to their age as opposed to like, um, uh, like one of the other music teachers, you know? So I think. On the other hand, however, though, there, there are instances when, like, my presence in the classroom can cause students to, like, I don't want to use the word act up, but, like, do behaviors that are undesirable for the teacher because, you know, they're either trying to impress me or get my attention. Um, but, yeah, if I were to do, like, continue this research, I think I would definitely spend more time in each of these classrooms to really get comfortable with the students um, and see what you know, a traditional day would look like if I was not there. Another good question. I don't really have an answer. I didn't really look into that very much. What I can say is, however, a large part of what influences these beliefs about talent, especially in the United States, is this, I guess, Western conception of talent in itself as like a hierarchical thing. You know, like it's competitive. You're either talented or you're not. Um, and we see that in some other cultures that are more communal and more focused on like community building the conceptions of talent just aren't there. You know, everybody is seen as musical because everybody participates in music from an early age. Um, and it's more, more so a cultural practice as it is compared to like a performative, a performative practice where you're um, in school and you're getting a grade and you're being scrutinized or rewarded in some way or another. All right, give it up for the give it up for the teachers in the world. Thank you everybody.
Yeah, how's that? Yeah, there we go. Okay.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Fripp. Uh, we are going to continue on with our next presenter, Steve Lockwood, and he's coming out with uh, the third one. Please help it out. Uh, he's sitting there. Uh, it's the Friday the 2nd Helen presents Rio Ankara here at Lake Park. The first one is going to start off with Andrew C. Kubelak. Can you please make some noise for Andrew? Andrew. Andrew. Hello, everyone. Thank you. My name is Luke, and I'm a musician. And that's not something that I could say about myself before coming here. In fact, it's not something I felt particularly confident saying until recently. Now, ever since I was a kid, I loved music. I can't think of a time in my life when I didn't have a favorite music artist. I don't leave the house without headphones. I haven't since I was in elementary school. I've been inseparable from the art form for as long as I can remember, at least as a listener. In my teenage years, I tried my hand at guitar a few times, but I could never really make it click the way I wanted it to. No musical sixth sense awoke within me, and that was fine. I decided that being a musician probably just wasn't for me. Now, when I showed up at college, my plan was to be a programmer. I had taken some computer science classes in high school. I liked the idea of making games. It seemed like the perfect fit for me. Flash forward to 2022, my sophomore year here, and I'm having a nervous breakdown because I came to the realization that I hated programming. I, did, I didn't want to do it. I hated it. It was terrible. I had never once felt satisfied or fulfilled while getting it done, and the last thing that I wanted at that moment was a degree for a job doing more of it. I felt like I didn't really have anything at this point. The thing that I was, the thing that I would tell people I wanted to be, was gone. The only other thing that I was involved in at all here was music, and this is true. The only reason I chose to be a music minor in the first place was because I didn't know that you didn't need a minor to be in college. So that's the only reason I started taking these classes. But <laughs> to, in taking one of my classes, digital music production, I learned the program Ableton. Now, if you haven't had the opportunity to take a digital music class here, first of all, I'd recommend it. It's sick. Second of all, Ableton, it's a digital audio workspace. It's used for making music on a computer. At the time, I had barely used it outside of that class, and I had just taken it on a whim. But it gave me this feeling that I had never gotten out of playing guitar, or trying to write sheet music, or writing words, or any of these other musical ventures that I had tried before. For the first time, it felt like I could create something, not just imitate something, but fully make something, bring something of my own into the world. It was a whole new set of tools that I had never considered before that opened my eyes to what it meant to be an artist, what it feels like to create something. So when I had this realization that I wouldn't be a programmer, I figured as long as I'm here, I may as well be pursuing something that I enjoy and chose to study music. In a very short period of time, I had a whole new goal. I wanted to be a musician. Flash forward another year or so, and I'm almost finished with the major requirement wise. Now the only big thing on the horizon for me regarding this was the capstone, and I felt a bit out of place. It seemed like I was surrounded by people, artists. They were used to uh, music, they were used to making things. And I was just beginning to learn what that meant personally. I wanted to use this project to improve these skills. After all, I didn't become a music major for a scholarly love of studying music or music history or anything like that. I turned to it because I enjoyed it. So for this project, what I set out to do was make an EP. Four to six tracks in length in genres that through the past year of casually learning this program, I re-fell in love with, that being electronic music. As for which electronic genres I wanted to make, I still didn't know exactly. The whole thing was up in the air for how I would go about it. And it was in this ocean of uncertainty that I was diving into that the second part of my project and the focus of this presentation emerged. How do I get better at doing this? As I got into my project and started thinking about how I can go consciously improving as a musician, I carved out three general areas for me to focus on. The first was technical skill. Now, as with any art form, you need to get better at the technical stuff. How do I engineer sounds? How do I make my synths sound good? How do I mix all my tracks together? How do I use the seemingly unlimited number of tools at my disposal? And how do I go about remembering all these keyboard shortcuts? This facet alone was a daunting prospect, but it was also the one that I felt the most ready to jump into. After all, this is what the classes that had made me fall in love with this program in the first place were all about. I figured the best way to improve in this field would be to dive into older and simpler forms of electronic music production and look online and try to replicate the artists that I enjoyed. 
The second area was creative skills. Now, w the entire thing is creative, but when I say creative, I mean how do I get ideas and how do I hold on to them? To some people, melodies, harmonies, lyrics, all of these things flow from them naturally whenever they're needed, but I'm not one of these people, at least not yet. The practice of being able to consistently sit myself down and write something good and appealing to me evaded me. I knew I could do it, I had done it before, but there were other times in which I would be sitting there ready to make a song, only to be met with nothing. I knew I had to work on this. Now area three was maybe the most daunting of these all. How can I force myself to actually make music? I knew this was something I enjoyed doing, it had made me feel ways I didn't know I could feel, and yet the idea of doing this every day, for as appealing as it sounded in theory, just eluded me. When I had the opportunity to delve into music, I could simply choose not to. I hate deadlines. Well, okay, I say I hate deadlines, but taking on a song as a project for a class or something like that was genuinely the only way that I could consistently make anything. I knew that soon classes would be done, and I didn't trust myself at this point in my life to not abandon this path without honing my discipline. So I decided I would use this one last college deadline to break myself out of this cycle. I needed to examine what was wrong. Why can't I remember how much joy this brings me until facing pressure? Out of every aspect that I was committing to improving, this was the most important to me. I swore that by the end of this EP, I'd be able to make music for me. Not for a class, not for someone else, not out of guilt for not working on it for a month, for me. So let's delve into how I went about tackling each of these aspects, starting with the technical skills. Now, when I started producing music for this project in the fall of 2023, the genre that I was the most comfortable with was drum and bass. It's characterized by ambient sound design, deep basses over drum breaks. I enjoyed making the songs that I'd done so far, but I was unhappy with a lot of things, like the quality of my drums, the clarity of my mixes, and the basses that I'd synthesized just never really hit the way that I wanted them to. So I decided to try and hone these skills that I already had by studying a precursor of the genre, Jungle which typically used sample CDs to get drum tracks and then chop them up to create a whole new rhythm for the song. I did some research into the genre and got my hands on some key sample packs from its history, Zero G, Jungle Warfare, and the Future Music CD, all of which were available for free on the Internet Archive, and I got to work trying to figure out the art of chopping breaks. And this is just a demo of what I had made during that time when I was focusing on that. After I got comfortable with this practice, I started focusing on other elements of the music, namely mixing in the atmospheric portions. I got some long synth notes and played them together while running them through a variety of reverbs and tone shapers. Then I resampled them in order to create ambient pads to use alongside of my drums. Here's a sample of those. Now, I was pretty happy with where I'd come in the week or so I spent studying these aspects of production, and I decided to switch gears into trying to improve my synthesis game. I created a track with simple stripped-down drums and a couple instances of a synthesizer plugin with some repetitive MIDI notes, and I spent some time familiarizing myself with the software. I followed tutorials on how to create basses, replicating songs that I knew. I messed around with the parameters on the synth presets from artists that I liked. Uh, trying to reverse engineer them and just overall spent a bunch of time becoming as fluent as I could in the act of synthesis. Here's a snippet of some of the bases that I made during one of these sessions. So this period of focusing purely on technical skills culminated in a live set that I put on, which had four original songs in the, yo? Okay, there we go. Uh, included four original songs that I made in the previous few weeks, combining my knowledge of synths, mixing, rhythm, and sound design. Here's a snippet of one of those new songs that I made.
Now, at this point, I had made enough new music to fulfill my original goal of an EP. Four new songs that I could polish up and call a day, except in terms of what I actually wanted to get out of this project for me, I wasn't anywhere near finished. Despite being completed songs, none of the musical ideas that I had in them were really ones that I was particularly proud of. It seemed every time I got an idea for a good song, a good element, it would evade me by the time I sat down to actually make it audible. I needed to find a way to capture these ideas, and while I'm at it, get more of them. I figured it was time to turn my attention directly to people who did this for a living. In order to try and hone my creative skills, I went on to a variety of sources, including the books Creative Quest by Questlove, The Creative Act by Rick Rubin, How to Write One Song by Jeff Tweedy. I also spent some time on Song Exploder, where artists talk about how specific songs of theirs came together. There's one short section in Jeff Tweedy's book called Pieces of Music, which instilled a new habit in me. Jeff's advice is to collect riffs, melodies, rhythms, samples, and store them for later. And I figured I'd give that a try. The method he recommends for this practice is to play it on an instrument, but I found that writing these down in a notebook in the form of verbal descriptions or drawing out the arrangement of the sounds was a good way to store these otherwise fleeting ideas. Admittedly, I had been keeping a notebook or trying to keep a notebook this whole time, uh, even before I started reading these books, but I haven't mentioned it because, quite frankly, I wasn't getting anywhere near as much out of it as I had hoped. My plan was to write down every time I came to a new realization about myself or my process, but despite writing out a decent amount of notes and telling myself that this was somehow important to do, <coughs> excuse me, I lost my, lost my place here, and telling myself that this was somehow important to do, I found the thing to be so intrusive and ultimately much more trouble than it was worth. The notes that I had didn't seem useful at all, and upon revisiting them, and for a while, I just gave up on the whole thing. It was only after taking Jeff's advice and saving me his ideas for later that I realized just how powerful this journal had the potential to be. When I sat down, if I needed something to work on, I'd open the notebook and look at what I'd accumulated. These words would range from notes outlining the digital steps to making a new synth, or techniques I wanted to use, or a song name with percussion I should try to emulate. Sometimes I would simply lay out basic song structure for an element that I already had, so that I had a clear goal of what to work on the next time I sat down. I always thought that these were things that I could reliably keep in my mind, but credit to Jeff, having them on paper really helped. Another one of the most succinct practical pieces of advice that I found was in Creative Quest, in which Questlove talks about overcoming writer's block instead of trying to create something new, try to create something out of a song that already exists. I had briefly experimented with remixes before, and I was shocked to find out how much of a kickstart a sample vocal track could be. Starting with an acapella for Central C's Sprinter and building from there led me to sculpting some of the favorite drums I've ever made, which ended up as the percussion for a song that I had been struggling with for a while. Take a listen to what that song used to sound like. It didn't have much energy to it, but after moving those drums into the project file for this song, and in turn getting invigorated to continue working on it, it now sounds like this. Now, Rick Rubin's book was initially a bit of a hard sell for me. He has this really ab abstract and at times esoteric way of talking about creativity. Uh, the farther I got into the book, the more I started getting out of it, though. There's this part closer to the start in which he talks about how he views creativity itself, where he says, human creativity is as natural of an act as trees bearing fruit. Just as the tree doesn't know when it's time to bear fruit, uh, the human doesn't know when it's time to be creative, but we do it because it's part of our natural rhythm. We're all participating in a larger creative act, and we're not conducting, we're being conducted. A lot of this book is dedicated to not necessarily creating something new as much as it is to channeling our observations into something tangible. After trying to view the world through this lens as if I were a radio conducting its signals, tuning myself to the correct frequencies, that journal of mine started seeing a lot more use. Rhythms in the daily world became more apparent. The opening and shutting of a door when it was raining filtered out the hiss in a way that could be replicated on the computer. Motorcycles blasting through Tejon as loud as possible outside of the shop that I worked at for no reason carried so much sonic energy and hit the air with such an impactful rhythm. I started relating these sounds to synthesis, to drums, to soundscapes. Here's what those motorcycles ended up as.
So at this point, I was more proficient with the software than I thought I ever could be. I was no longer short of ideas when I needed them, and now all I needed to do was sit down and let the magic happen. I could get this EP knocked out in a few weeks, at least that's how I rationalized it. In reality, there was still one more piece of the puzzle missing, that third piece that I mentioned earlier. My work ethic was terrible. I knew I could sit down and make something that I was proud of, but for whatever reason, actually bringing myself to do that was so much more difficult than it should have been. I said before that I hated deadlines, and I didn't want them to dictate when I could get my work done via these long, stressful periods of crunch. I recently learned that I had anxiety, and in retrospect, I have to wonder if that has anything to do with why I struggled to work on this stuff in the first place. I associate doing it with these feelings of stress, and in turn, put it off until I can't ignore it, at which point the cycle only repeats within me. No, I could stand here and rationalize this stuff all day, but the fact of the matter was, I wanted it to change. I had this dream that I would be able to get to the point where I would just sit down and make music whenever I felt like, as if it were a game that just so happened to bring creative fulfillment. The truth is, it's work. It's fun work. It's work that I enjoy, for sure. I love doing it. But I can't just keep sitting around waiting to want to work. I found an interview that the artist Fred again gave a few years ago, in which he says that the musical skill that he consistently practices more than anything else, more than performing, more than synthesizing, more than any of those skills, is the practice of discipline. He describes it as a muscle that, like any other muscle, can be trained. This means even when you're uninspired, even when you don't feel like you can do anything right now, you should still work. And the more you work, the easier it gets. I started making sure that at least some time each day was spent making music, however I could. If my notebook was dry, I'd lay down some simple drums and throw in some samples to see what happens. If nothing sounds good, I'd use that time to browse sample libraries and put together a folder of sounds that I could use. If I didn't feel any desire for something new, I'd revisit my previous tracks and see if there was any little ways that I could tweak or improve them. Admittedly, this is a practice that I've only started recently, but in a few short weeks, I found the prospect of working on music to be much easier than I have in the previous months. I genuinely feel like I have grown more as an artist in these previous weeks of discipline training than I have in a while. I've begun to view my music and its creation as my own, something I didn't even realize I needed to do. At this point, I feel more comfortable making music than I ever have. In fact, when I sat down to make this presentation, I got sidetracked and made a whole new demo that I'm genuinely really proud of. Check it out. Now, of course, I didn't get rid of procrastination within me entirely or anything. That's, that's, that's baked into me. But I did manage to take control over one of the most important things in my life right now. In this moment, I'm genuinely having a blast making music. Throughout this project of self-analysis, I've found a pocket of creativity in which I feel invigorated to pursue something for myself. Right now, the most difficult part of this whole project is trying to come up with a name for the thing. I hope you got something out of my half-year-long self-therapy session. I want to encourage anybody listening right now who maybe feels the same way, unable to fully delve into what you care about because your mind is holding you back, try your best. Tune in, put in the work, and take control of what you make, whatever that may be for you. Thank you. Do I have any questions? just like reliable knowledge that I could sit down and make something. That wasn't something that I really felt before. It felt like it was all things that I was doing because I had to, as opposed to things that I was doing because I was able to and wanted to. And that shift was the biggest flip throughout the entire process. What's up? Um, how do I feel about using other sources? Like, like the morality of it? Um, I think that once you've made it your own, you'll know it. If you don't know it, if you're still thinking about it, you need to do more work. And that's fine. But 
once you've made it your own, once you've transformed it, that's something that you need to realize for yourself. And once you have that confidence, you're set. Yes. Uh, yeah, a lot. Peekaboo, he does these live streams where he'll just sit down and put stuff together. He's super um, like fast with it. Like he'll he'll delete an entire like two hour worth worth of music in an instant if he's like that's not really feeling not really feeling good to me. It's like oh my god, that's so inspirational. Like I I want that I want I want that non caringness to make something that I care about. If that makes sense. Um, like that 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 creative attitude was super inspirational for me. Uh, that that might not be good advice for everybody. Don't feel the need to throw anything out, <laughs> but it works for me. Uh, nowhere yet. Give me a month. <laughs> I appreciate the enthusiasm, though. <laughs> All right, you set? Oh, yes. Do I have it in mind? No, but I'm sure there will be one. I think this is gonna be something that as long as I'm giving this proper attention to, like doing it for me, I think those, those next steps are going to reveal themselves naturally. Um, as for genres, like you were talking about, I think I'm just going to naturally, again, it's just gonna be natural. Whatever I come across next that I want to delve into, that's just, that's gonna be where I go. Um, that's what happened with those, and that's what's gonna keep happening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bella. For my capstone project, I wanted to create something that combines my separate musical interests that normally would not go together, while also learning more about the musicians that have influenced me. As a musician, my main focuses are playing the guitar, mainly electric, as well as composing instrumental music, usually for solo piano. I decided I could incorporate both of these interests into my capstone by creating an EP that covers a variety of genres and different approaches to creating music. This EP is called The Snail, The Rock, and The Lemon. And we will cover three of my songs, a classical piano piece that turns into a jazz rock song. Yeah. 
an EDM song and a song using acoustic guitar and various objects as instruments. Through these three songs, I was able to explore the kinds of music that I already love and am comfortable with, while also challenging myself to create music unlike anything I have already done. Through the process of creating my EP, I also wanted to improve my guitar playing, composition skills, and abilities in music production. This presentation will cover my writing and recording process, mainly through discussing the songs Snails, Lemon of the Night, and Literal Rock Song. The first song I would like to discuss is Snails. I knew I wanted to write an instrumental song inspired by one or more composer from the Romantic era. My original plan was to compose a string quartet with my main inspiration being one of Dvorak's quartets, but through the process, I ended up deciding to write a piano piece inspired by a variety of Chopin's nocturnes. One nocturne I especially looked to in composing this was his nocturne in G minor, opus 15, number three, where the influence can mostly be found in the simple chords and rhythm of the left hand and in the key signature because I also wrote my piano part in G minor. So I'm gonna play the beginning of his nocturne. The bottom is mine. Um, I composed this section in a notation software called Sibelius and exported it as a MIDI file, which I put into Ableton using a digital grand piano sound. Despite not being a live recording, I wanted the piano part to sound as natural as possible, so I made small adjustments to the note velocity and lengths, particularly the highest notes, to make it sound less robotic. I also put reverb on the piano to better reflect the parts in the original score that would be played with a pedal in a hypothetical live setting. I wanted to keep the intro as solo piano because rather than combining all the instruments in the intro at once, I wanted the different sections of this song to be able to flow in and out of each other rather than overlap so they could each draw attention independently while also being connected to each other without transitions that are too abrupt and confusing. There is a small violin part that comes in occasionally with the piano, but serves more as a background sound to support it. This initial piano section was supposed to serve as something that the rest of the song could build off of into different musical styles, but is also supposed to be substantial as a little song in and of itself. Towards the end of the intro, the piano is joined by a rhythmic bass line to indicate the song is going in a different direction. The bass line starts off being deliberately noticeable, but also simple enough that the transition is not too abrupt, and so the next section of the song doesn't sound completely random. Similar to the piano intro, I also made the bass part digitally and processed it with a plugin specifically made for getting a realistic bass sound. After the bass line has established its place in the song, I recorded some guitar chords that assist the bass's rhythmic purpose before introducing the drums and then allowing the guitar to take a more melodic role. Like the piano part, the drum track in this song was also created digitally, and I made slight adjustments to it in order to make it sound like a live instrument. The guitar part is the only instrument in this song that I recorded live. After the first jazz rock section of the song that comes in through the bass, drums, and guitar, the piano re-enters the song, taking on a role similar to this section instead of its original classical purpose, which I did to tie all the instruments together and make the song more coherent. The outro of the song focuses on solo guitar, which takes the song back in the direction of the intro by repeating parts of the initial piano melody. This is meant to make the song come full circle and feel more complete, while also giving it a more gentle feeling than the jazz rock section, so the song doesn't end too suddenly and has time to fade out. I'm going to play part of the song from the end of the piano intro and its transition into the first guitar section.
The second song I will be playing for you from my EP is Lemon of the Night. As someone who does not regularly listen to EDM and has no experience in making it myself, I referred to a non-musician friend for a simple explanation of how he would define it and an example of one or more of his favorite songs within the genre. One of the songs he liked called Sponge 808 felt fitting for inspiration since the point of my EP is to mix genres and explore making types of music that are new to me because the melody of the song is just a synth playing for a release over and over again. I thought this was a funny coincidence considering not much of the EDM music I have heard, which given is not a lot, has so obviously featured a well-known Beethoven piece and because of how it aligns with the purpose of my EP. So here's a part of the song Sponge 808. My friend's initial description of EDM was one word, which was bass. When asked to elaborate, he said a lot of bass and a lot of drums, and a lot of the time some strange lyrics or vocals right before a bass drop. <laughs> While this is still a short and vague definition, I kept it in mind when working on Lemon of the Night. The name of the song is inspired by an astronomy class I took last year where we used a telescope to take pictures of Saturn. And to me, these pictures just looked like a glowing lemon and not a planet. And I had the idea to make an EDM song with the only words being lemon of the night. <laughs> I recorded two of my friends here at CC saying lemon of the night in various ways. I told them I wanted one recording of them just saying the words regularly, one of them yelling it, and a few more recordings of them saying it in whatever way they wanted or saw fit, allowing them to have a more personalized contribution and so I could have a variety of audio clips to work with, also making it the only song on the EP with vocals. This piece also differs from my other songs because of how unfamiliar the genre is to me and because for this song's purpose, I did not necessarily want or need to process all the instruments, especially the drums, in a way that made them sound like a live performance, given the more artificial nature of how instrumentation in this genre sounds to me. I wanted the music to sound consistent and precise to be more in line with the relevant songs recommended to me by my friend. The song begins with a drum beat that I created using digital drums, which then changes in tempo before transitioning into a more consistent and EDM-specific area using the vocals more unique and consistent percussive sounds, and bass lines that I originally got from Splice before processing them so they were more adjusted to the sounds I wanted for this song. While the tempo change before the second section is maybe not something that is common within, within the genre, I wanted to try to make it unique and challenge the boundaries of the genre while still having it be consistent enough that EDM could be seen as an accurate description of the song overall. So now I will play a small part from the middle of Lemon of the Night. bass in the beginning sounds like that. The final song I am going to talk about, Literal Rock Song, was the first idea I had for a song I wanted to write. The intro has a voice recording of my mom and I talking to each other on a family trip when I was around four years old. I got it from one of many old tapes that she has from when I was a kid, and I thought it would be cool to use a clip from one of them for a song a long time ago, so this project gave me the perfect opportunity to actually do that. This song is the most personal to me because of how long I had been planning to create something like it. And because I originally got into guitar and writing my own music when I started teaching myself guitar 10 years ago with the same <laughs> acoustic guitar I used in this song from before I owned an electric one. During and immediately after the voice recording that can be heard in the song's intro, 
There is a subtle recording of birds that I found in my phone's voice memos from Vermont, which is also where the voice recording is from. I thought the two fit well together, and from this combination, I decided to use the song as a kind of dedication to my family and where I grew up. I also wanted to use this song to explore possibilities for objects that I could record and process to get unique sounds to use as instruments. Going with the theme of the song, I recorded sounds of rocks, literal rocks, yeah, and tried to adjust them with reverb and by transposing them to make the sounds blend well with the voice recording instead of sounding too separated and abrasive. I decided to do this because using objects as instruments was something we discussed a lot in my experimental music class at CC, and since then I've wanted to spend more time exploring different approaches to doing this. I wanted these sounds to complement each other in a way that would suit the natural environment sound I wanted to accomplish with the song's intro. I wanted them each to serve as kind of sporadic and subtle pieces of sound that apply to the voice recording, rather than serving as a constant rhythmic or melodic purpose. The intro then transitions into a simple guitar part in the key D minor, which I chose because I thought it was a good key to reflect the nostalgic feeling that I wanted the song to have. I then recorded an electric guitar part over the initial chord progression that begins with short spaced out parts leading up to a more prominent guitar melody. Although I originally planned to have lyrics in this song, after making more progress with the intro, I decided to have a guitar part as the song's main melody instead. I thought it would more effectively achieve the feeling that I wanted the song to have and would allow the intro's voice recording to stand out more as the only word-centered portion of the song. For the same reason, the second guitar part was meant to sound smooth and fluid, so I processed it using a lot of reverb and yeah, and split it into two tracks panned to opposite sides so I could make them kind of echo each other and sound more layered. So now I'm going to play part of the voice recording intro and its transition into the guitar section. As the song moves on, I wanted it to kind of peak in a cinematic way that catches the listener's attention and sounds more powerful while maintaining the gentle nature of the intro, which I did by gradually increasing the intensity of the bass line to make it sound thicker and more prominent, which then goes into a synth chord progression that connects the original guitar part. I thought the introduction of a synth with a crescendo would make it clear that the song was transitioning into a more dramatic section but would also pair well with the intro, and I processed the synth to keep some of the intro's fluidity. To finish the song, the synth section transitions back to the original acoustic guitar chords and ends with similar sounds to the intro to make it feel more full circle. This ending is also meant to reiterate the importance of the intro throughout the song and to bring everything back to the intro's natural feeling. By creating this EP, I wanted to expand on everything I learned from the many music classes I've taken at CC whether it be my classes on music history, production, or theory. I also wanted to be able to reflect the parts of music I've always loved, while also exploring things that I haven't had a lot of experience with. Now that I have finished the EP, I want to continue writing and producing my own music, which I will hopefully be able to do more efficiently after having spent so much time working on the skills I've already learned and expanding on them in ways that are specific to my own music. Moving forward, I also think it's important for musicians in general and also me personally to appreciate the process of learning while creating music and making adjustments to reflect that as I go instead of only focusing 
on the final product and everything I have to fix about each song to get it to where I want it. I had about eight or nine general ideas for songs I wanted to make going into this project, so in the future, I'd like to try creating the songs that I didn't get to for this EP, especially a classical guitar song. I want to keep focusing on the specific kinds of music I am already passionate about while also continuing to explore kinds of music that I wouldn't normally, both as a listener and a writer, to hopefully make me a better musician overall and allow me to create music that is more well-informed and draws inspirations from many areas of the music world. And these are all the people and planet that I would like to thank. Thank you. Um, I guess I just had very different interests or ideas for like specific songs I wanted to create and then making an EP like that, I guess then I could do all of them <laughs> together. Yeah. This one I drew myself a couple days ago. Um, yeah, these are all just pictures that I took like in high school when I was really in into photography. I still like it, but I just don't take as many. And I just picked ones that I thought would apply. Or well, this one's from the telescope at CC. So I was like, oh, that's where I solved the lemon. That's the actual lemon because I've been asked about it. Um, yeah. And this one, well, the song's about Vermont. Technically, this picture's in New Hampshire, but they're like, you know. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I felt like, like I felt like the process of writing the different guitar parts and like recording them was the easiest. Like for a lot of like the like solo like electric guitar, it's just me recording stuff over the chord progressions I had and then just cutting out ones that I liked. But I thought um, the production aspect of it, specifically with drums, was so frustrating because I was really bad at it. <laughs> Spent like hours just trying to make drums sound. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But I think I got a lot better at it. I hope. Uh, probably the same thing as what Luke said, like in a month. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> On October 8, 2021, I sat down in Packard Hall and heard a sound I've never heard before. I arrived in the hall for a mid-afternoon concert called The Music of Stephen Scott, a celebration a two-day-long celebration of life for Professor Emeritus and Bode Piano Ensemble founder Stephen Allen Scott. This concert was the Bode Piano Ensemble's last ever public performance. In the minutes before the concert was to begin, Packard Hall slowly filled with people, community members, staff, faculty, students, alumni, Programs rustled, voices spoke quietly as all found their seats, awaiting the dimming of the lights and the beginning of the music. The first half of the concert showcased a wide variety of Stephen's work, from solo piano to jazz band compositions. For the final live piece on the concert, though, the stage was cleared completely. A Baldwin grand piano missing its lid was maneuvered on stage. A group of 10 people entered, quietly approaching and surrounding the piano. The slight murmurs and rustles within the concert hall ceased with the appearance of the musicians. I couldn't take my eyes off the stage, drawn in by the unknown of what I was seeing. The standing musicians reached into the piano and took up long strands of clear material which seemed to be woven between the piano's strings. The clear strands drawn taut between their hands, the musicians bent slightly over the piano and made eye contact with each other, holding completely still in the utter silence. Then, with a breath, they moved, like a single organism. An otherworldly sound replaced silence in the hall, like an organ, a cello, a synthesizer, like nothing I'd ever heard before. Twenty hands moved slowly up and down, drawing clear bows across the strings of the piano in tandem, pulling gorgeous music from the innards of the instrument. The music ended far too quickly. I could have watched them play forever, their movements as hypnotically beautiful as the music itself. The Bode Piano Ensemble was founded right here at Colorado College in 1977. But this story really starts in fall of 1969, when Stephen first began working as the music department's newest assistant professor. His background in contemporary music, particularly minimalism, was immediately clear in the musicking opportunities he created within the department. And what strikes me in particular are the ways in which his project centered student initiative and creativity. As the director of the orchestra, he often programmed contemporary chamber music, and his very first concert with the orchestra featured an original work by a student composer. He was also the director of the Electronic Music Studio and instructor of the Electronic Music Course. As the director of the studio, he updated the studio's equipment to the best of the best. They had a Moog synthesizer in addition to an early digital synthesizer, the Synclavier. In 1972, Stephen combined his passions for ensemble playing, his love of experimental music, and his drive to uplift student creativity and founded the New Music Ensemble. The New Music Ensemble, or NME, were dedicated to performing new music for both traditional instruments and electronic music uh, media. And that's New Music with a capital N, capital M. It's a genre of contemporary Western classical music that incorporates electronics, uh, non-traditional performance techniques, and elements from the music of other cultures and countries. The new music ensemble from its very first semester was a touring ensemble. In their first year, the enemy toured Northern Colorado with a premier program featuring compositions by Stephen himself, as well as electronic works by several student members of the NME. 
For five years, the NME put on concerts all over the United States. It was a creative space for students to learn experimental music by new music composers and to write and perform their own music. Similarly, Stephen himself now had a group of committed and creatively minded performers with which to trial his own new music creations. And so he did, writing original pieces for the NME nearly every single year. But in 1977, Stephen and the ensemble presented a work that was more than just experimental. It was an entirely new genre and maybe a completely new instrument. This was, of course, Stephen's first piece for Bode Piano Ensemble, aptly titled Music One for Bode Strings. This is as good a place as any to answer the question, what exactly is bowed piano? Well, Stephen first got the idea of bowing the piano from a composer named Curtis Curtis Smith. Beginning in the late 60s, Curtis Smith was working as artist in residence and composition teacher at Western Michigan University. During this time, he was also working closely with David Burge, uh, a pianist who centers contemporary and extended technique works in his performances. Um, for example, he's quite well known for playing and premiering many of George Crumb's compositions. In the early 70s, Burge commissioned a solo piano piece from Curtis Smith, and it was within this commissioned work that Curtis Smith pioneered the bowed piano technique. Curtis Smith worked at and refined the design for his bows until he found just the right material that produced just the right sound. Um, he used monofilament nylon fishing line, long strands doubled over and over again to create flexible bows. This picture, these pictures are of um, bows used by the bowed piano ensemble, but they look pretty similar to the ones that uh, Curtis Smith invented. It's basically like a long bundle of fishing line with two tabs on the end for you to hold onto. Um, applying copious amounts of rosin to the fishing line allows it to catch and resonate against the piano strings. So after you weave the bow underneath the piano strings, you draw it up and down to produce sound. And here I would like to invite uh, Ryan and Steph to join me. Thank you. Um, so Curtis Smith went on to complete um, Rhapsodies in 1973 for David Burge using these fishing line bows. Um, the sound and technique clearly captured his imagination because that same year he wrote another work for solo bow piano, this one titled Ordress. And it was this piece that Stephen heard performed by David Burge himself in Boulder just three years later in 1976. 
Like nearly everyone who hears it, Stephen was immediately drawn into the soundscape of bowed piano. And as a composer himself, he began turning the concept over in his own mind. He thought, what would it sound like if multiple people bowed the piano at once? He set to work on this concept immediately. And in 1977, he completed Music One for bowed strings. 1977 marks a new beginning for Stephen's compositional career. He would compose 26 works for bowed piano ensemble over the next 36 years, which is an incredible amount of music. And each of the pieces that Stephen wrote are for bowed piano ensemble, a minimum of 10 people all reaching into the piano and creating sound simultaneously. Using these fishing line soft bows requires both of your hands, so only one person can only bow one note at a time. But if 10 people are bowing together, they can play hocket melodies. Uh, each note is played one after another, like you saw me, Ryan, and Steph demonstrate just now. Each of Stephen's bowed piano ensemble compositions builds off of what came before it. He wrote for solo bowed piano ensemble. He wrote for bowed piano ensemble plus brass and woodwind instruments. He wrote for bowed piano ensemble plus chamber orchestra. He wrote for two bowed piano ensembles playing simultaneously. He wrote for bowed piano ensemble plus six more grand pianos, all on this stage at once. <laughs> and of course, after meeting his wife, Victoria Hansen, he wrote for bowed piano ensemble plus soprano soloist. The bowed piano was never a stagnant instrument. The members of the ensemble were constantly innovating new techniques, new implements, new practice strategies, new ways of bringing Stephen's music to life. So in that sense, 1977 also marks the beginning of a musical and cultural institution, the Bode Piano Ensemble itself. Not long after the celebration concert memorializing Stephen and his work, I met with my advisor, Ryan Banyagale. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait for it. <laughs> Ryan is a Bode Piano Ensemble alum. I found this out after watching him bow the piano at the celebration concert and after seeing this great video of him and his haircut in the early 2000s. <laughs> it's on YouTube, you should go check it out. It's really good. It's really good for a lot of reasons, including Ryan's haircut. <laughs> As we chatted about the music and Steven, Ryan mentioned the possibility of introducing me to Victoria Hansen, Steven's wife and the vocalist on his later compositions. He told me, Victoria's got all of Steve's materials and scores stored in her basement, and she's been meaning to organize them and donate them to special, special, <coughs> special collections over in Tut Library. I volunteered to help her organize, and in early September of 2022, I went to Victoria's house for the first time. The basement of Victoria's house is the Bode Piano Studio. It's split into two rooms. One is lined wall to wall with storage shelves packed with boxes of programs, cassette tapes, and CDs. The other houses the Bode Piano. Yes, the Bode Piano, the very same Baldwin SD10 Grand used by the Bode Piano Ensemble for decades. When we arrived, Victoria gave us a quick tour of everything. Um, she said that she was really overwhelmed by the organizational process and she didn't know where to start. And standing amid the boxes of programs, scores, bow-making supplies, newspapers, and books, I began to understand how overwhelmed Victoria felt. But my initial overwhelm gave way to utter fascination as I took a closer look around the space. I had known a little bit about the Bode Piano Ensemble before showing up at Victoria's house. I knew that they'd been around since the 70s and that they were a touring ensemble. But for an ensemble made up of a mix of liberal arts college students, its reach was far beyond anything I'd expected. Pictures across one wall and a map on another told me that the Bode Piano Ensemble had toured and performed across the world, from Canada to the Canary Islands to New Zealand. They'd performed in incredible venues like the Sydney Opera House, Jazz at Lincoln Center in New York City, and a volcanic lava tube cave Stephen wrote pieces for bowed piano commissioned by the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra and the Pacific Symphony in Orange County. And as I later discovered, the ensemble inspired experimental composer John Cage to add fishing line bow techniques to some of his older works. 
and they performed a piece written in collaboration with minimalist composer Terry Riley. And that's not to mention their six CDs, all of which were recorded right here in this building, and many on this very stage. They were not just a local CC eccentricity. They were directly connected to some of the biggest names in experimental music, and to some very well-known Western classical music groups and venues. And now, suddenly, I found myself granted access to nearly every single relevant document about the ensemble and its 37 years of history, all of which were unarchived and thus inaccessible to the rest of the musical world. Um, needless to say, I was hooked. I wanted to do whatever I could to help preserve and share the history of the Bode Piano Ensemble. So far, the information I've discussed has come from my archival research. Long hours spent with Victoria in her basement, reading and scanning and listening. But though Stephen's archives are rich with information, they can't paint a complete picture of what the ensemble was. The ensemble was, as I discovered, so much more than a musical experiment. It was a community, an ever-changing, ever-growing group of CC students with a shared musical interest, shared inside jokes, and shared experiences brought about by being in the ensemble. Preserving the legacy of the Bode Piano Ensemble means preserving the memories and experiences of the students who were in it. This is really the crux of my thesis. The ensemble existed, and it did all of these amazing things, it went to all of these amazing places, and it changed the lives of the students who participated in it. All of this comprises the history of the ensemble. So during the summer of 2023, I interviewed 22 Bode Piano Ensemble alumni. These 22 perspectives span the entire 37 years of the ensemble. From Bruce and Jean, two of the earliest members of the New Music Ensemble, to Nick, one of the last student bowers to join before Stephen retired, to Lynn and Sienna, two alumni from the mid-2000s who returned in 2015 to play with Stephen in his post-retirement community group. Everyone I spoke with shared beautiful things with me about how amazing it was to play music together in close quarters, bending and reaching and bowing as one organism, about the inside jokes they'd share with each other, like pulling their best new music face in photos uh, modeled after this super serious headshot of Steven, <laughs> <laughs> about how Steven uh, empowered them by programming their original works and their arrangements for Bode Piano Ensemble on concerts about how Stephen would write music just for them, like his A Rosary of Islands, which featured multiple members of the ensemble on their own instruments. I heard stories about flying over the Sydney Opera House in a tiny airplane, about being filmed for a documentary in London, and stories that sound like a blast, but that I should probably not share in front of these students' former professors. <laughs> All of this history, musical, personal, and experiential, I compiled into my thesis essay. This essay is the culmination of the research I conducted through exploring the Bode Piano archives and through the 22 interviews. In it, I tell the story of the ensemble from start to finish using all the information I had access to. My fellow seniors who were with me in junior seminar and those of you who I talked to at the very beginning of this project will notice that this end product is pretty different from what I initially aimed to create. I won't rehash all of that here. Instead, I just want to talk about what my thesis is and where I aim to take it next. My essay is, in effect, the first draft of a book that I aim to publish or somehow release into the world, hopefully within a few years from now. This is my goal for a few reasons. First, and perhaps most academic, the Bode piano, specifically Bode piano as played by an ensemble, is an entirely unique organological invention which means it's a brand new instrument. Uh, and the work I've done is unique in the sense that zero other works have been published about Bode Piano or the Bode Piano Ensemble. So this work is extremely important as it introduces the Bode Piano to other researchers in the fields of musicology and organology. And it helps to expand musicology's focus to include music outside of the Western classical tradition. Secondly, my original hopes and dreams for this project stemmed from a desire to bring to light the incredible history of the Bode Piano Ensemble, an ensemble founded at this very school. So what better way to bring it to light than to release it out into the world as a book? Or better yet, 
to release it as an open source text, eliminating the cost barrier and making the information truly accessible to all. I have truly only scratched the surface of Bode Piano Ensemble lore. I didn't talk about the time they were featured in Life Magazine or their publicly broadcast radio performances in New York City, Australia, and Slovakia, or the fact that on many of their tours, they were playing at international music festivals, and they were the only student group playing at these festivals. And that's not to mention the possibilities that could come of a deep music theory analysis of students' works, and not to mention all of the other implements and tools that the ensemble used within the piano to create sound. But to conclude, I'd like to discuss one final thing. In every stage of my research, I found myself confronting the same question. Why did the Bode Piano Ensemble end? It's a simple question with a complicated answer, or rather a complicated non-answer, because really, I still don't know how to answer this question. Steven retired in 2014, and though he and a group of alumni continued to rehearse, this community ensemble only lasted for about a year before people just got too busy to keep up with it. Whether or not Steven wanted the ensemble to carry on within the music department is another question. For the last years of his life, Steven was suffering from dementia. It's the deepest tragedy of the whole story for a lot of reasons. And unfortunately, it means that it is difficult to say with certainty what Steven really wanted for the ensemble and its place within the music department towards the end of his life. In addition to Steven's wishes though, there's also the general question of institutional memory. As I've conducted this research, I've been surprised at the lack of attention given to the preservation of the ensemble's legacy. Returning to this photo for a moment, this is the Bode Piano Ensemble playing alongside the Estonian Bode Piano Ensemble at the celebration of Colorado College's 125th year. This year, as we know, is CC's 150th year. And in the time between these two milestones, the Bode Piano Ensemble seems to have completely fallen off this institution's radar. I suspect that the Bode Piano Ensemble is just one example of a unique initiative that began and thrived at CC that now very few people remember, which is a shame for a school that prides itself on its innovation. This school and this music department has a foot in the door to the rich and beautiful world of contemporary experimental music. But if they're not cared for, information and memories and artifacts about the world of the Bode Piano Ensemble will disappear. That said, the interview process gave me the most wonderful feeling of love and hope and confidence that the Bode Piano Ensemble will never disappear. Lynn Holliday, an alum who graduated in 2005, told me that she wasn't even surprised when I emailed her asking for an interview. Um, she said that she feels like she's always talking about the Bode Piano Ensemble, and that the Bode Piano Ensemble is always coming back into her life in one way or another. And that same sentiment was echoed by so many of the alumni I interviewed. I heard story after story about how the Bode Piano Ensemble changed people's lives. Traveling with the ensemble taught these students valuable lessons about communication and confidence. It introduced people from all different majors from all across campus who might never have met otherwise. And many of my interviewees told me that taking a class with Steven fundamentally changed the way they listened to music. Being in the ensemble and playing Steven's music shaped the musical lives and undergraduate experiences of so many students. Whether you in the audience are an ensemble alum yourself or this was your first introduction to the Bode Piano Ensemble, I hope you'll agree with me that even just a glimpse of this legacy is really a beautiful thing to see. Thank you. Trustee Chan. I think the answer is no. The answer is no as far as I know. And if the answer is yes, then they're as hidden and undocumented 
as, as the bird piano ensemble has been. But, but from what I have seen and the research I've done, there's no one else writing for bode piano ensembles, except for the bode piano ensemble alumni who wrote for bode piano ensembles. <laughs> That's a great question. Well, like the answer is definitely yes. And it also makes me think of um, this event that the, the New Music Ensemble did, when was this? Like in the 90s, it was called Ruined Piano Day. And so they had a, uh, like, a, like an upright piano out in that courtyard over there that was like totally falling apart, totally ruined, totally out of tune. And they were playing all this music on it. And it, uh, I don't have a recording of it, but I assume it sounded extremely interesting and probably very beautiful. Um, and there's this, this, I can't remember who the quote was from, but Stephen had it in the program for that event um, about how a ruined piano is like nature's prepared piano. It's like, it's just another version of the instrument that creates music that's just as beautiful. So I think bowed piano on, um, I think that would sound beautiful. <laughs> That's like <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, this is a great question. <laughs> I mean, maybe Steph would tell you that it was just as inconceivable back then. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. There was also a lot of, like, for their longest tours were, um, they traveled to Australia and New Zealand three times. New Zealand just once, but down, down under three times. And those tours were their longest by far, and those always took place in the summer. Um, so I, I have some funny stories about several students missing their graduation. They missed walking because they went to Australia instead. And they were like, I wouldn't have missed that for the world. Like, screw graduation. <laughs> I'm playing the bow piano in Australia. <laughs> But yeah, uh, getting into the ensemble just really quickly, like there, there was a bit of an audition process, um, but it was really based around like how well you can, um, like your rhythmic capabilities. There was sight singing at some point, but that kind of came in and out. Um, it was really, the audition was a way for Steven to get to know people and get to know that they could commit to this. It's like, is this something that you wanna do? And is it something that you can do twice a week for three hours in the afternoon, and on top of all the tours, um, if that answers your question. Yeah, Michael. Here, I'll go back to Ryan's favorite picture. Yes, that's a great point, Michael. Something that I wasn't able to convey really in this presentation is how important choreography was. Um, it, it's, it's such a, I mean, 10 people, so 10 notes, right? But songs have more than 10 notes in them. So if you're done playing your note, you gotta run around the piano and pick up your next note. Or maybe you'll be playing a, there were um, rigid bows, which is like a popsicle stick that you just like in the piano. Maybe, maybe instead of a soft bow, you're doing a rigid bow instead, or you're picking the strings with guitar picks. And so you have to be really like fluid and just aware of, <laughs> of your body in relation to everyone else's. Um, it's really like a dance. It's very cool. And also going off of that, so this, this video, this is called Entrada, and it's on YouTube. All of the ensemble CDs are on Spotify, and I would highly recommend listening to them. Um, this is. This is an area where the ensemble's music is, is actually very accessible. It's all on Spotify. And maybe Apple Music, but I don't have Apple Music. <laughs> uh, so I, I couldn't check. But, but this is a good thing, that you can just go and listen to most of, of their music. It's really cool. Yeah. In the back.
Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, we have another <laughs> alum in the audience. Yeah, the just intonation, a another just amazing element that I couldn't talk about. They, they retuned the whole piano to um, a just intonation tuning uh, uh, instead of the more typical equal temperament tuning that we use today. Um, and it, it's just is the most incredible sound because when you're bowing, you get all these overtones, as I'm sure you heard um, in our demonstration. And the overtones in this alternate tuning is just like crazy, super cool. Victoria. <laughs> Yes, that's the um, London documentary. So that, that is also available to watch. Super cool stuff. Sam? That's such a great question. Thank you. I mean, I think, I don't know. Man, I could like talk, I could talk for another 20 minutes about that. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like when I, like I've always, I played piano since I was a kid, and it's always been very classical stuff. When I came to CC and started working with Sue Grace, I learned about George Crumb and all the cool things you can do if you reach your hands just a little bit further inside of the piano. And I think that step was really important for me because it, it made me realize, like, this is a type of music that I didn't know you could do. I didn't know you could play the piano this way. And now that I know, I am, like, deep in it, like I, I want to keep learning more and I want to keep doing more. And so um, to come across something like this that happened at this school that I didn't even know about before I had spent two years here doing the exact same things that I was so fascinated with to like a huge scale, um, it, was, it was just really impactful and I think um, has, kind of, has kind of guided my direction. For instance, like doing all this archival research um, I didn't know that I wanted to be a librarian until I realized that I really like doing all of the things that librarians do. And part of learning about that was doing this project. And I'm like, wow, I love this and I love doing this. Um, yeah. Nisa? That's okay. That's a good question. Um, my work and my, my project hasn't really focused on that. That's kind of a, um, it gets complicated because there's like copyright and BMI and all this, all this fun stuff that Victoria's had to deal with. Um, so that's um, a question that I can't really answer because <laughs> it's a little bit like too complicated for me. But I do know that Victoria's been working with um, our music library and Tut library uh, to get those, at least some of the scores available or something. <laughs> yes. So they will be available, um, which is extremely cool. Yeah.
proud of. It seemed every time I got an idea for a good song, a good element, it would evade me by the time I sat down to actually make it audible. I needed to find a way to capture these ideas, and while I'm at it, get more of them. I figured it was time.